Welcome everyone. Uh, this is a new series that we're putting together. We've got Pat Clyer who is doing the uh, photos and taking care of managing the computer part of it. And of course I've got Bob Schneider, the old photographer once again, uh, doing all of the uh, filming and not only doing the filming but doing the editing and putting together a final version. So I thank them. Uh, this is a series of five different programs, uh, and they, they surround the time of Christ. Start out with here at our first uh, lecture that, that we've got here, that we're going to present, is the time of Christ. And it starts with Herod, who of course was the uh, king of Israel at the time that Christ was born. And then, of course, he's going to die, and his three sons are going to take over. But I want to spend a lot of time uh, talking about Herod because he sort of sets the tone. And you'll, you're going to find out what a violent person he was. Uh, there, were, there were two reasons for that. He was only half Jew, so he was always afraid that people who were really Jewish were going to come along and throw him out of power. And then he was the wrong kind of Jew. He was a Nabathean Jew instead of a uh, Hasmonean Jew. And so there was always that battle going on too, that some Hasmonean Jew would come along and throw him out of power. And he always reacted in the same way. He always reacted violently. Uh, there was one person, for instance, who was going to lead a, a revolt uh, by the name of simply uh, the uh, S Samaritan. And he has 30,000 followers, and when Herod gets wind of it, he puts them all to death. And the person who was Caesar Augustus, who was in charge of the whole of the Roman Empire, of which Herod's Israel was part of, once said that he would rather be Herod's pig you know, than Herod's son. Because Herod's pig, of course, the Jewish people didn't eat pork, so that pig was safe. But his sons, if he even smelled a chance of rebellion, he would have them put to death. You know, he had his wife put to death, he had his mother-in-law put to death, he had an uncle put to death, and he had four or five of his sons put to death too whenever he smelled a plot, like they might be trying to poison him, or they might be figuring out a way you know, to assassinate him. He just would act instantly. And then, you know, to uh, just be a threat, and he would say, he would have all of their heads cut off, and he would put them on pikes and put them on the walls surrounding Jerusalem as a sign for people, don't you dare rebel against me or this is what's going to happen. But I hope you enjoy this series and I hope that you enjoy this first one, which is about Herod. Herod in many ways uh, did a lot of things that were good for the Jewish people. Uh, he wasn't all bad. And he built a lot of different territories. He rebuilt the temple uh, as one of the things he did. He also, in, in times of food shortage, would bring in food. Uh, the Israelis did not have to fight the army because they wouldn't fight on the seventh day. But at the same time, you know, the zealots, the zealot party and others were going to always be active in trying to overthrow him or to, after him to throw the Romans' rule out of Israel. But I hope you enjoy this series. This time what we're doing is, rather than a mass, we're doing a PowerPoint presentation. And the topic is going to be uh, the Roman Empire at the time of Christ. And we're filling in a lot of the background and, and, and what Christ, the time that Christ was living in. And of course, that's going to start with Herod. Uh, we all know of him through the Bible and the persecution of the innocents, but there was a lot more to Herod's life than that. And I think when you see some of this, you're going to realize that it was a very violent time. 
and Herod himself is a very violent person. And a lot of that will explain uh, what fed into his mind that created some of that violence that he, that, that he carried out that. But Herod was a shrewd person, and he had to, first of all, become the ruler, the king of Israel. And he shifted alliances. He went from Pompeii to being allied with Caesar when he knew that that was uh, something that would be advantageous to him. And also he shifted from Mark Anthony, who was down in Egypt, to Octavia, uh, who was going to become the ruler of uh, the Roman Empire at a later time. But Herod was appointed king of Judea by Mark Anthony from Egypt in 40 BC. And uh, he had to take the territory by force. So even though he became and was appointed the king of Israel, it wasn't something that he just could take over. But he had to go in with an army and actually take his territory. And Mark Anthony would help him do that and would uh, actually uh, give him some forces and, and give him uh, support in taking over Jerusalem and the surrounding territory of Israel. What Rome needed was Rome needed a, a buffer state between uh, is between themselves and the Mediterranean Sea and all of these other tribes that existed out in this area. And so Israel was important to them in the sense that it created a zone uh, that would protect them from invasion from this direction. And uh, when Jesus was born, all of Palestine was going to be ruled by Herod, and he was born in uh, 73 BC, and he would reign for about 37 years. Now, one of the things that, that was in the background was what type of Jew Herod was. Uh, he was a Panamanian Jew, and his father's name was Antipater, and his grandfather's name was Antipater also. And they were both Jewish. And they came under suspicion because they had been converted by these Hasmonean rulers. So there was always that question of, were they really Jewish? Or did they just become Jewish because that way they could become the rulers of a certain territory? And uh, Another thing that happened was they had been forced you know, from out in this territory into this territory by uh, the Nebotan Arabs. So there was a lot of question as to how Jewish they really were. Herod's mother's name was Cyprus, and she was a Nebethan Arab, and she wasn't Jewish. And so Herod became paranoid because he was only half Jew. And uh, he was the wrong, not only was he half, only half Jew, but he was the wrong type of Jew. He was a Herodian Jew and not a Maccabean Jew. Another thing that took place during this time was Herod, of course, lived in a very violent period of time, and Christ was going to live in a very violent period of time. And uh, Herod himself, uh, and, and then of course, uh, the other rulers at the time, there were three different rulers. There was Caesar, who was in, in Pompeii, and Crassus. And those three you know, were going to rule the whole Roman Empire. But as you can imagine, they're all people that are suspicious of one another, and you know that kind of friendship bond isn't going to exist for very long. And the first person that's going to get pushed out is Crassus. And Crassus himself you know, was 
an extremely violent person. In fact, uh, when you have the uh, Spartacus revolt, uh, when you have the Spartacus revolt, Crassus is going to step in and you know, he's going to crucify 6,000 slaves that had revolted along the Appian Way just you know, to show the people that you did not mess with the Roman Emperor. But can you imagine crucifying 6,000 people? It took every tree there was in the, in the area to get that many crosses. And of course, then what happened after that was uh, you have Spartacus and Crassus end up in a battle, and of course, he's going, Spartacus is going to be defeated, and then after he's defeated, uh, you know, we don't know if he died in battle or what happened exactly to Spartacus, but as I said, there would be 6,000 of his followers that would be crucified. Then what happened was Crassus, and if we look at this, Crassus invaded another piece of territory uh, in, in Parthia and uh, got defeated in Parthia. And he, Crassus himself was a very, he, he just loved money. And so he, he would raid these places and then it, you know, was interested in taking all the money he could you know, from them. Well, he goes into Parthia and he gets defeated. And they cut his head off. And uh, the ruler of Parthia, is a person by the name of Morad II, is watching a play. And they come in and they throw Crassus' head up on the stage uh, where or, uh, or it is. And you know, he had turned because he knew how greedy Crassus is. He, he, he has some gold melted and he pours it down Crassus's mouth. And uh, that's, the, that's the end of, of Crassus. And so it's no longer three people you know, that are ruling, but now it's two. And we move on. We've got Caesar and we've got Pompey. Now Pompey was a rebellious sort of person. And the two of them aren't going to be friends for very long. And, but Pompey uh, misjudges how powerful Caesar was. And so he's running around and being rebellious. And then Caesar gets his army, goes after Pompey, and he's chasing him down uh, to Egypt. And uh, the next thing that's, that's going to happen is, is Pompey is going to, we've got Pompey and these two drop paintings, and you've got Caesar over here. But uh, the next thing that happens is uh, you've got Pompey uh, being assassinated and put to death you know, on his way to Egypt. Now, we've been switched back and we've got Herod, and Herod is the, the person who is going to be ruling Israel. And this is, this is what takes place. The people who rule, uh, as, as Herod is going to rule, they have two different jobs. One is to raise money, and the other is to keep the peace. So those two things are, are what Herod is going to be all about uh, when he's the ruler in Egypt. Or, I'm sorry, in Israel. And uh, as the ruler, he's going to make sure that there's, that he quells any type of riot or any type of opposition that might come up. And he's going to do it in many different violent ways. But this is what's important to remember. It's important to remember that here, if we, uh, here has all kinds of different people that are going to oppose him in one way or another. And uh, at the same time, he's going to rule for the most part out of a nearby uh, seaport called Caesarea Philippi. 
and uh, he's going to come into uh, Jerusalem, but only when there are feasts like the Passover or other times where they thought that the Jews might rebel. And uh, so they, it's, it's not like when we think about it and we read the Bible, we think, oh, those soldiers were there all the time. Uh, the soldiers were stationed actually on the outside borders. And probably most Jews who lived in, in Israel never even saw a Roman soldier. The only time that they probably would was uh, Herod they had a personal force of 3,000 soldiers. And, uh, and, and, and Pontius Pilate too, at the time of Christ's crucifixion, would have 3,000 soldiers, but they would be stationed in Caesarea Philippi. And then you know, they would be brought down into Jerusalem for these feasts like the Passover, because they were, they were there to keep the peace and it was thought that there might be a rebellion that was taking place. Uh, another thing under here was that you know, the taxes uh, weren't extreme and uh, the Jews were exempt from the army because they wouldn't fight on the seventh day. Uh, Herod and, and Pilate would bring in food when there was times of, of shortages. Uh, they would donate money to building projects, and the Jews probably really appreciated the Roman rule in many different ways. And uh, people like Pilate or Herod also sponsored the Olympic Games. The types of protests that there were. We've mentioned the idea of the Feast of the Passover, and that was kind of a silent type of protest because what's the meaning of the Passover? The Passover comes from the Exodus where God sent the plagues and things of this nature. And then finally, you know, the people are let go and end up leaving uh, Egypt and going to Israel. And so they, when you would celebrate the Feast of the Passover, in the back of people's minds was this idea of being free now from Roman rule. Uh, also, there were nonviolent protests, and probably the most famous one would take place after Christ in the year 26 AD. And that was when uh, Pilate and, and some and others uh, would put up the Roman insignia on the temple. And of course, the Jewish people thought this was a sacrilege, that, that uh, you, would, you would even put a symbol of the Roman Empire on the temple. And so they protested, and then what, what the rabbis and the, and the people did was they sat down and they bared their necks uh, defying the Roman soldiers and saying, if you want, you can behead us. Well, the Rome back down, took down that insignia that was a Roman insignia and, and left it, uh, took it off and, and just put it away. There were also violent protests, a lot of them uh, being led by the Zealot party. And uh, the Zealots were a certain group that um, in the Jewish uh, community that believed that the Romans should be driven out of the territory. And um, they uh, would lead, again it would be after Christ, but they would, they would in 70 AD, they led a rebellion thinking that they were going to be able to throw the Romans out. Well, the Romans sent in a huge army, and then they laid siege on Jerusalem, and they laid siege on another uh, fortress that Herod had built that we'll talk about, Masada. And that siege lasted for three years. And uh, they would circle, like Jerusalem, or they circled Masada. And if anybody tried to escape, they got killed, because the Roman soldiers just surrounded the area. 
eventually, after three years, the Romans got tired of sitting around and waiting for them to quit. So they uh, broke through the walls of Jerusalem, killed everybody in it, and, uh, or put them into exile. And at Masada, they also built a ramp because Masada was 300 feet high and broke through that wall only to find that all the Jewish people had committed suicide. A final type of protest that the Jewish people used against the Romans was what could be called and categorized as a religious revolt or a religious protest. And uh, they were self-styled prophets who were predicting that God was going to intervene on behalf of his people. Now, these occurred, the best examples of them occurred after Christ. Uh, Fifteen years after Christ, there was a person by the name of Thudius who was going to say that he can part the Jordan River in sort of like Moses parted the, the river and then left uh, Egypt. And of course, the water swept back and, and killed the Egyptian army. The, uh, Theus was, was saying all this, and then what finally happened is the Roman rulers just sent out an army and killed everybody, killed him and everybody that was following him. There was another person uh, 25 years after, and he was just simply called the Egyptian, and he had 30,000 followers, uh, and he predicted that he was going to blow his trumpet and the walls of Jerusalem that were controlled by the Romans would come tumbling down. And of course, Rome is going to react to that. They'll send out an army and they'll kill all 30,000 of them, along with the Egyptian, who was the leader of that group. And what they did was, they would cut their heads off, put them on a pike, and then they would set that pike on the walls around Jerusalem and everybody had to look at that and say, you know, we better not revolt because that's what will happen to us if we do revolt. Uh, what Pilate himself is actually going to react to one of these groups so violently that Rome is finally going to shut him down and put him into exile. But this is where John the Baptist would fit. You know, John the Baptist would probably have fit in this religious revolting group. Uh, Herod himself Herod himself was known as a builder and in one of the places that he built was uh, Caesarea uh, Maritima and I visited there. These are pictures that I took when I visited it but it was out on the Mediterranean Sea and this is just a part of what's left where the royal palace was. And we'll go through, I've got a number of shots here. This is the stadium, and, and this much of the stadium still exists, but you know, all of this was where you know, some of your gladiator fights took place uh, and, and uh, all kinds of things to amuse the people. And uh, this is, the, this you can't, you can only see a part of it, but this is part of a, a much larger track. Uh, it would be like a racetrack, or it would be like a track that we would use in high school for athletic events. And they had horse races, and with chariots. You know, we've all seen, I'm sure, those horse races and chariot races in different movies. And they just have an iron one here to symbolize the horse races that took place in this area. And then, of course, this is the area uh, that was at one time would have been like right off of the horse track. And it probably was used for maybe lions that were then used for entertainment and killing people and things of that sort. And then uh, this is the final one. This is an interesting stone. This stone is, uh, depicts and it has the name of Pontius Pilate chiseled into it. So we know for sure 
that Pontius Pilate was actually in Caesarea Philippi uh, because of the fact that that stone can be found there. And then uh, also, this is a sea castle, and up here you have the aqueduct that brought water, fresh water in uh, to the city. And then this is another, and it's another of his towns that he built up on a mountain again, Sebaste, which is in ancient Samaria. Remember, the, there was a difference between the Jews of Jerusalem and the Jews of Samaria. The Jews in Samaria worshipped their God on a mountain, and the Jews in, in Jerusalem, of course, worshipped God in the temple. And then this is probably one of the most impressive places that you can visit in all of Israel. It's, it's called Masada, and it was a, a fort that Herod built. And when he built it, he built it on a mountaintop that's 300 feet almost straight up. And when you look at it, this is a model of it. When this is the, the fortress itself is up on the top, and then this would have been Herod's home down on, on this next level down. But you can see how that's just a steep, steep climb up there. So if, if you were in that area and you were, you were being chased, like if Herod, if somebody was going to try and assassinate Herod, Herod would, would go here with his army. And he probably could survive four or five years because they had uh, their grain storage and, and they had a, a unique water system that, uh, that took place. Uh, sometimes the, the Romans were ingenious when it came to just figuring out how to do things. But how, for instance, in the middle of the desert, this is in the middle of a desert, how are you going to get water? And there, but there were rains at certain periods of time, and you could just kind of make up. There was one narrow path that comes down through and comes down to ground level. And what they did was, they off the path, they bored holes into the rock, and then when when it would rain, the water would come down the path, and then it would go into those holes and it would be trapped, and, and they would have uh, cisterns that would trap that water and keep that water. But that was what I thought one of the more fascinating things about Masada. So we'll continue on. And uh, this, is, this is looking out. This was an old wall at the top. And then that's the Dead Sea in the background. Uh, and you, but you get an idea of the, how the elevation, when you're looking down and looking over, at just how far down it is. And this again is just a view, you can see this little trail going through, but also you, you get an idea of how steep that, that wall is and how difficult it would have been for a soldier to try and climb up there and, and do any fighting. So. Uh, and this is one of those, this used to be those grain storage bins where, you know, they, they brought the grain in. Of course, it had roofs on it at the time. And they, they, could, they probably had enough grain to last them, I would say, three to five years in, if there was a siege. And, event, and this is this, the uh, synagogue where the Jewish people worshipped. And this is what remains of it. Uh, there's, I've got another picture of it where you can see this is the inside of that synagogue, a drawing of what it would have looked like back in the days when that whole thing, the whole structure uh, was in good shape. And this, you're looking down again, and <clears throat> what was, the, what had happened was, there were probably about 3,000 zealots that revolted in 70 uh, AD after Christ. 
And when they revolted, of course, the Roman army came in and surrounded Jerusalem, surrounded the 3,000 uh, people that were living and had escaped to the to Masada. And uh, they, they had an encampment where the Roman soldiers were camped. And then, of course, they, they surrounded the whole of Masada so that no one could escape. And what eventually is going to happen is the, uh, the, the people, the Roman army is going to get tired of, of waiting. And so they built a ramp, if you can imagine. They built this ramp of dirt all the way up to the, the, all the, way up to the, uh, to the wall, and then they broke the wall. But what, what the Jewish people did was, they knew that if they got captured alive, that they would be subjected to tremendous torture. And they knew that they would be sold into slavery, things like that. So they made a pact, and there were, what they did was they chose 11 people that, were, that, uh, that killed the whole of, of those 3,000 people that were up there. Uh, they committed suicide, basically, is what it amounted to. And then the 11 drew straws, and the person with the short straw killed uh, the other 10, and then uh, killed himself. So when the Romans broke in, what they, all they found was all of these dead people. And, but it just, it just tells you, you know, how violent a time it was. Uh, there, there's another of, of, uh, of uh, Herod's fortresses. It was a place called Macarius. And you can see it's built in the same style, up on a mountaintop, just like Masada was. And this is just another uh, picture of, of what's left of Macarius now up on the top. But look how steep that is going up there. Here, and this is just a final picture. And, but this one is Macarius, but this is where Herod Antipas is going to have uh, John the Baptist in prison. And this is where John the Baptist at Macarius is where John the Baptist is going to be put to death. Then uh, you have, besides Masada and Macarius, you have the Herodium. The Herodium was, if you notice, this is Jerusalem, this is Bethlehem, and this is the Herodium. This is about a distance of 26 miles. And again, this one, if you look over here, this was a self-made mountain. They brought the dirt in and, and, uh, and built a mountain and then built a fortress up on the top of it. And, and this was the fortress that they built. And then, of course, you had your agriculture going on down below. And so that you could flee back up into the fortress if need be. And this is Herodium is going to be where Herod is finally uh, put, put when after he dies. Uh, and this is Herodium again. Uh, you can see how it's built here. This is where the agriculture took place. And also, you know, this is the, the uh, and the swimming pool is in this area. This was Herod's theater box, which still exists and the, the painting on the side of it. This is interesting, those, you see those stone shelves. Uh, what they did was, they were kind of, there were rocks that were round, and they had them up on the top of all of these mountain fortresses. So Masada had them, and uh, other places, they were quite big. So if the soldiers tried to come up, they rolled them down on top of them and killed them by, by rolling the stones down off the top of, them, of these fortresses. Uh, when the, one of the things, if you visit Jerusalem, you're going to see a model of 
the city. It's, it's probably, I would say about 50 feet long and about 30 feet wide. But you'll see the temple itself is up there on the right hand side. And then this is the lower city of Jerusalem. And then the upper city is up here. And Herod's palace is going to be over in here. Uh, Golgotha, where Christ is going to be crucified, is going to be outside the city wall in, in this area. But it's, it's pretty impressive when you go and when you study it. And it's, it's something really neat to see. And this is a, a picture of them rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem. So when they came back, one of the things that, that when they were put into exile uh, in 587, when they were put into exile, of course, every building was torn down, every wall was torn down, and so the whole city had to be rebuilt. And one of the things that was rebuilt were the walls of the city. And then this is, this is the, a, a picture, this is the temple. And again, what you're seeing is this model that they've built. But the temple is in this area. There's one thing I would point out to you, and we'll come back to it with a different picture. But see this right here is sort of, it's like three stories high. And this is where the soldiers would sit. And, and where if, if the ruler, like Pilate or Herod, was present, he would sit up in here. And then, of course, you've got you know, your courtyards where, remember when Christ was driving the people out of the temple, uh, the courtyards were here. And then the temple itself was here. And I would point out that, that the main part, the center of that temple, was about 45 feet high. So it, it was a pretty uh, tall structure. And, um, and, and then when you look here, uh, if you look off to the corner, uh, you're going to see that there's a place called the Antonia. And the Antonia was a fortress itself with four towers. And um, it's here you know, that the army would keep some of their soldiers so that they could be on immediate call if there was trouble in the, in the temple area itself. And it's going to be here that one of Herod's uh, wives is going to be in prison and then put to death. But uh, Antonia was an important part of, of the uh, whole system. Now, you had Herod actually in part of his building, and he, he actually rebuilt the temple. And what he had to do to rebuild the temple was he had to tear the old one down. And there were a lot of Jewish, like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, people like that, that were afraid that if Herod tore down the temple, it would never be rebuilt. But Herod had, had plans that, of building something that was just incredibly uh, magnificent. And he did. Uh, so this is a picture actually of building the temple. This is what up in the cor corner there is what the temple actually looked like. And you came in and then of course the Holy of Holies is on the back side of it. There were two curtains that you went through to get to the Holy of Holies. And you know, this, of course, is the Ark of the Covenant, or a model of what the Ark of the Covenant looked like. And uh, of course, it had the, the stone tablets with the Ten Commandments in it. Uh, no one ever knows what happened to it. It just disappeared in one of these revolts and, and, re and rebellions. So, uh, if we move on, you've, you've got an inner cutout. Uh, the temple was 60 feet long, 45 feet high, and, and then there's the surrounding area and the courtyards, and also the altar of sacrifice uh, out here is where all the animals were sacrificed uh, in, uh, to God. And then, as I said, 
this is another uh, picture of the temple. This is a picture, as I said, where the soldiers would stand and sit and watch and make sure that there wasn't a rebellion taking place. And if it was, they were there to quickly uh, quell it. This is a model of Herod's palace, which was on the other side of the city. And then, of course, <clears throat> Herod himself was a man of many appetites. Uh, he had, if you can believe it, he had 10 wives, and he had 500 concubines. And, uh, and not only that, but he was always worried that somebody in the family was going to try and depose him. As we said, and, and one of the people that he really worried about, he had this a wife named Mariama. And Mariama was uh, going to be his greatest love, but at the same time he was just going to hate her because she was a Mac uh, Maccabean Jew, and of course he wasn't. And so she's always plotting his destruction. And Herod's sister, Salome, is going to say that uh, Mariame had this tremendous, almost magical hold on Herod. And Salome would be feeding him information that was wrong about how vicious she was trying to be and how she was always trying to uh, undo his being king. And, and put someone else in, in his place. He suspected that Mariami's uh, brother, Jonathan, was being promoted to uh, be the king and they would kill off Herod. So Herod invites him to one of his palaces and then he has some of his soldiers hold him underwater and drowns him. And uh, Mariami, his wife, always accused him of killing her brother. And so that was sort of the start of things. But then, also, beside that, she wanted uh, his, her two sons, and of course his sons, to, be, to become the rulers. And so they plotted to, uh, to put him to death. He found out about it, and then he had her arrested and she was kept in the, in the uh, Antonia in prison. And then eventually she was going to be executed, probably strangled to death. Uh, she was put on trial and then put to death. But to make things worse as far as Herod was concerned, as Josephus, the historian of that time, said, she died with the greatness of soul. Uh, there, when she walked out to be put to death, she did it without changing the color of her face. She walked out very nobly and was put to death. Herod then reacts. He goes berserk with grief. And he shrieks for her around the palace, calling out for her you know, to come and, and be with him before she's dead. Uh, he orders his servants out to go and find her as if she's still alive. You know, and he, just, he tried to detract himself and, and put away his grief by holding big banquets. And then to, make, to keep her alive, he had her preserved in a vat of honey so he could go and look at her body that was in this, this vat of honey. Alexandria, who was Mariami's mother and who had been involved in the plot, escaped being put to death herself because she lied and said that she hadn't been a part of it. Well, then Alexandria in turn, the evil mother-in-law, uh, after saving her skin once, she decides that she's going to uh, put another, try to put another person you know, in charge and have Herod put to death. And of course, then Herod reacts. He has Alexandria uh, put to death and, uh, and four of her closest friends along with her. Uh, so then, 
you have all of this going on, and uh, you have Alexandria's sons who have been put to death, uh, Alexander and Aristobulus, and then you have Doris, who is another wife, has a son called Antipater, and she, they're going to try and have Antipater take the place of Herod. Herod finds out about it, you know, and he kills not only Antipater, but he kills 300 uh, Roman officials that were sympathetic to putting Herod to death so that they can all, they will have no part in it either. Uh, Antipater had tried to poison Herod and did, just didn't get away with it. And then after that, uh, after that, uh, Herod is going to uh, make out another will and there's going to be three people that are involved in that. Uh, Philip Archelaus, who uh, is going to be there when Christ and Mary and Joseph return to uh, Jerusalem, and another person called Antipas. And then, in 4 BC, uh, Herod dies after reigning for 37 years, and his body is going to be taken uh, to the Mount Fortress of Herodium for burial. Um, when, when all of this is taking place, uh, the uh, Herod is 60 and he's just in really bad shape. Uh, his, his body has got a glowing sensation to it uh, because of his intestinal uh, diseases. He itches all over, his feet and his belly have swelled, and it's complicated by ulceration of the colon, and then his body starts to ooze clear, clear fluids, and he can scarcely breathe, and there's an evil stench, a vile stench that just emanates from him. And his gentile genitals swell up grotesquely, and then if his scrotum finally bursts, and worms set in on his body while he's alive. So he goes to Jericho to try and recover from all of this and to go down to the Dead Sea and hopefully by being dipped into the Dead Sea, uh, all of this will go away. But it didn't go away and he ends up dying. And then uh, his body is going to be taken uh, to uh, Herodian where he's going to be uh, buried. The thing that, that happened at the time of his death he knew that people hated him, so how was he going to keep them from just cheering and being happy at his death? Well, he rounded up 300 people that were leaders in the area, and he had them put in the Hippodrome. And then he, he, he told his soldiers and his uh, army officials, when I die, the moment that I die, put all 300 of these people to death, so they'll be, the, the populace will be saddened by the fact that, you know, their, their leaders, their other leaders have been put to death. It didn't happen. Uh, when he died, uh, they were released. But just to show you uh, how much he was hated, when he died, Archelaus, who was one of his sons, you know, danced and made merry, you know, as uh, if an enemy had died and not his own father. Herod was then carried the 24 miles to Herodium uh, where he was buried, and there was a huge procession uh, that took place at the time of the burial. And then with that, uh, we kind of covered all of Herod's uh, time in the early, early years of Christ, when Christ was a child. These are some pictures of Jericho where uh, Herod would finally die. But this is a larger picture of the ruins that are still there. These are some of the ruins that are there. Uh, these are uh, more of the ruins over on that side. This is the castle that Herod lived in. And this also was 
a fresh water channel where water was brought into the city uh, so that they could survive under attack. This is Herod's family tree, uh, his ten wives, and then when he died, as we said, he made out a new will, and uh, his sons, there were three sons that ended up getting parts of, of Jerusalem and, and parts of Israel. The center section, that gray section, is the part that Archelaus ruled and the part where uh, you know, Herod had, or, or, where the Herod had given to him. And of course, Archelaus is going to be another one of those vicious rulers. So, this is the Herodium again. Uh, this is up in the top group. This is where Herod was buried. And this is a 2,000-year-old fresco in, in Herod's tomb. 